We're going to start back up in Romans chapter 8 here in just a moment. See if I can uh, keep from standing on my head like I did last week, apparently. Um, those of you who weren't here, sorry, inside joke. you got to be here every week to get all of the humor that comes out occasionally. So let's pray together, and then we'll dive into Romans 8, talk about some things here. So pray with me. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be together, to indeed fellowship around your word. We are glad to share this time together. We are glad to share this piece of life together. We thank you that you are with us in it all. We pray, Father, that as we open your word and as we consider uh, the, the gospel and the significance of the death of our Savior, would you help us to respond with faith and help us to, to see the wonder and the beauty of it all, even as we wrestle with some very difficult questions and issues related to that great event. You have loved us well, and we thank you for your great love for us, for your people. We thank you for the death of our Savior, the death of your Son, the sacrifice there that you would deliver him over for us is an expression of your deep love for us. And we thank you, uh, Father, for your care for us in that way, that you have done all that is necessary to rescue sinners from our terrible plight, multifaceted problem of humanity. And so we thank you that we can trust you for these things and to complete the good work that you've begun in each one of us. So help us as we open your word, help us to hear you speak, help us to see what's there and guard our hearts from confusion. Help us instead to rest in you and for things that we don't understand or things that are hard, help us to still cling to you and seek you for clarity and for grace over time. So thanks for the opportunity to talk about these things. Thanks for the opportunity to listen to your word yet again and to be confronted with the wonder of your grace and your love for us. Help us to embrace it. Help us to love you well in return. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So open up to Romans 8 if you haven't already. Uh, we'll read verses 31 to 39 yet again and we'll pick up uh, with the can of worms we opened last week, and uh, we'll see if we can get a handle on those wriggly things. Uh, Romans eight thirty one to 39. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So as we enter into this passage yet again, we see the language of election. We see the language of Jesus being handed over for us. We see the uh, language of Jesus' love for us and God's love for us. And it raises the question when we have those pieces in the same paragraph here, what is the nature of of election, that's one question we need to wrestle with a little bit, and what is the significance of Jesus' death for us being specified there? The question is usually phrased, for whom did Christ die? And in this passage, the connection is made with the elect, a group, a certain group of people whom God has chosen, 
That's how, God, how Paul defines the elect in this passage, the repetition of for us throughout the passage, all the way back even to the previous paragraph in verses uh, 28, 29, and 30, connects those dots. Paul's focus here, at least, is on those whom God has chosen and how Jesus' death, Jesus being handed over, connects with that group of people and God's act of choosing. The most important question that we can come to, though, I want to start with that, is where we really ended last Sunday. Don made a comment as a kind of our closing word for last week about the significance and the wonder, the marvel that God chose me. And that really is a good place to start. Recognizing that whatever you believe about the broad picture of God's election and His electing love, you have to bring it down personally. That God chose me. That God chose you. Don't let anybody generalize election to such a degree that it's just this big corporate reality. That God just chooses either everybody, which doesn't make any sense, because the language of election specifically means to choose a group out of a larger group. And don't let anybody minimize the significance that God chose you personally. Because what we see here is if you're a believer in Jesus, if you're among the us that's being talked about, that everything in this passage applies to, you are among the elect that, God, that Paul is focusing on here. And so start there. But that raises another kind of sticky question that comes up at this point. How do you know that you are among this group? How do you know personally that you can say, God chose me? And to bring in Ephesians 1, if you want to ask about the timing of when did God make this choice, when did He choose you, Ephesians 1 is very plain in that regard. God chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world. So we're talking about an event that took place long, 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 long ago. You weren't around. <laughs> you didn't exist. And yet God chose you. How do you know if that is the case? And the Bible does answer that question explicitly. And so I want to draw your attention there before we look at the rest of this context in Romans 8 to talk about that reality. But if you'll flip over for just a moment to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. The question, how do you know God chose you, is addressed and answered by the Apostle Paul. And so we, it's fair to ask the question, and it's a good thing to see that we are not left in the dark uh, to think about this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, Paul writing to the Thessalonian church, the Christians there, and he says in verse 8 of... 1 Thessalonians 1, for, nope, verse 4, sorry, go back to verse 4, 1 Thessalonians 1, 4, for we know, Paul says, we know, brothers, loved by God, that He has chosen you. Okay, so just stop there for half a second. Paul says, we, so he's talking about Paul himself and his companions, the apostolic ministry that went on in the Thessalonian church, and he says, we know something about you. So he says, we can stand up here and look at you, Thessalonian Christians, the people in the church of Thessalonica, and we know something about you. We know that God has chosen you. And then verse 5 begins with the word because. And so this is how does Paul know that? How does Paul look out at these Thessalonian, Thessalonian Christians and know that God chose them before the foundation of the world? How does he know that? Verse 5, because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. He goes on, you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. Verse 6, and you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. So what Paul is describing there is the evidence of election. And that evidence can be summarized really simply as the appropriate response to the gospel. 
The gospel was preached to these pagans in Thessalonica and Jews among them as well, and many of them responded to the gospel. The gospel came to them in power. That is, it hit them as unbelievers, and then it powerfully changed them to believers. That's what the gospel does. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, as Paul said in Romans 1, 16. It's power that comes and changes you. It takes you from what you were to something different. And here he sees the evidence. He looks out at those Thessalonian Christians and he said, you're imitating us. You're imitating our faith. That's how I know God chose you before the foundation of the world. That's evidence. And so that's the only evidence we're given in the Scriptures. How do you know you were chosen before the foundation of the world? Are you, have you, responded to the gospel with faith and repentance? And do you see evidence of the Spirit's transformative work in your life? That's the only answer to the question that the Scriptures ever give. And so it's not for us to be looking out and before someone responds to the gospel, try to figure out, well, is this person chosen? Were they chosen before the foundation of the world? That's not the question on the table. That is irrelevant to us. Instead, we all, as Christians, have the responsibility to proclaim the gospel to everybody on the planet. Those who respond with faith and repentance, we can say with confidence with the Apostle Paul, when we look at their lives and we see the evidence of the Spirit's work, you were chosen before the foundation of the world. That's how we make sense of election. And it, it, it can, again, there's all kinds of other questions we could ask about God's electing work and our response to that. But truly, the response is not to election. You're not, we don't go around telling people, God chose some people to be saved. Now respond to that. We go around telling people, Jesus died to pay for sins. And He calls everyone on the planet to repent and to trust Him. That's the announcement of the gospel in a nutshell. That's what we go around telling people. And so we don't have to ask the question ahead of time, especially... Has God chosen this person? Has God chosen them? But instead, once people respond to the gospel, you can find the comfort and encouragement that the whole doctrine of election is supposed to bring about. That's the reason that Paul ever talks about it, or Jesus, or the other New Testament writers talk about election, is to bring comfort and encouragement for believers. That's the source and the fountainhead of God's love for you. And so when you see that, don't immediately at least rise up and say, well, what about, well, but what about, what about? How does my free will fit into that? But that's not the first question you need to ask. The more important thing is to say, wow, I know how awful I am, and God chose me. And then you can worship Him and respond with gratitude because you know that there's nothing in you that commends yourself to God, that attracted Him to you. And then you can ask your philosophical questions if you must. But make sure that as you seek out those answers and you wrestle with those questions, you start from the text of Scripture. That's the most important thing that we can say from the beginning. Now, questions, reflections? Ed? Yes. Uh, the whole, I mean, this, I'm trying to figure out a way to get out of the, the problem of God did not desire anyone to perish. I'm saying there's a little element of free will in there. That, that's what I'm getting at. I mean, first of all, I'll go back to what I said first about Ephesians 1 5. It looks to me like, and I've seen other people retranslate, so to speak, that Greek. And. 
I'll start there, because that, that was a question that came out of what you just said, so I'll start there. So the simple answer is no, you cannot do that. The language is very clear. The pronoun us is the object of the verb predestined in Ephesians 1.5. You can't manipulate the grammar that way, but even if by some grammatical magic you could switch that around to say that God is predestining a concept, which I don't think makes sense, first of all, with the language of predestination, you also cannot do that with Romans 8.30. It's predestined those whom he foreknew. It's still predestining a group of people rather than any kind of concept or action. And so you can't make the grammar, change the grammar there to make it say that. It, it really is predestining people. If you could rearrange them, yes. <laughs> there are words for that, but I, I won't mention them. <laughs> I, I'm going to forego the other pieces of your puzzle there for the time being. Don. What I understand is that for new is a big word because God knew my future before I was born. Right? Before I was mm -hmm. ever brought up by anybody but him. Right. Yeah. But I also know, I believe, this is where what Ed's saying was a little bit of free will. I think God knew that I would, so, so to speak, and it's hard to say this out loud, but I would choose him. <laughs> sure. So, yeah. So that's why I look at the foreknowledge. God yeah. knew who his children were before he, before he, before he created them. Sure. Okay, but he did more than that. It wasn't just that he knew what was going to transpire. That's what the texts are saying here, Romans 8 in particular. Yeah. Ah, based on. That's a very important word. That's, that's a very important word in all of this. Based on. And the question that we have to wrestle with, and we won't get there biblically, textually, until Romans 9, is does God give us a basis for his choice of us. Because it's not just about foreknowledge. Foreknowledge and election are connected. I tried to show that a few weeks ago with Romans 8 connected to Romans 11 and how Paul defines foreknowledge not just about knowing events that are going to happen, not, not, not just about knowing the future. That's true, he does. But it's a more personal knowing ahead of time. And it's hard for us to conceptualize that, but it is connected very much to his electing. Again, let's not try to remove the meaning of the word. I mean, you can't just erase it like it's not in the text. It means to choose, and you have to wrestle with that. Now, there are tensions in the Bible, and I, I fear that's where we really struggle, is we're trying to flatten the tensions out. So we have a tension that says, God doesn't delight in the death of the wicked. So, is that Ezekiel chapter 8? Um, God doesn't delight in the death of the wicked. And yet you've got other passages of Scripture using the same exact language from Deuteronomy, I think, um, but where there are multiples where it says God delighted to destroy them. Okay, you've got to hold those in tension and not give up one for the sake of the other. And the same thing is true when we start talking about God doesn't desire for any to perish. That's part of a tension that we have to hold together. Does God delight 
in judging evil? I hope we can say yes to that. As God expresses His character, all of it, justice included, we can't say that He he somehow shackled Himself into a corner to where He has to do something He doesn't really want to do. Ed? Well, you can't say either or. He's a God of... Well, you kind of lifted that out of its context there. Do you know the rest of what it's saying in that passage? <laughs> but let me go back to what you just said the, before that, the, the dichotomy between God of redemption versus God of retribution. And he's a God of redemption, but He redeems through retribution. He, gets, he, he pays for sin through the death of His Son. So you can't separate those out as though they're competing uh, characteristics of God. Sure. They seem to jump out. What does that mean? <laughs> They seem to jump out. They're all there together. <laughs> I mean, let, let's go back to Romans 8, because this is held together in a singular context. Romans 8 is part of the book of Romans that talks a good bit about God's wrath and God's judgment being poured out. And so this passage that we're looking at even here in Romans 8 includes both ideas, because it's the very reality, the remedy of God's wrath against all people, is that He has come down to deliver His Son to purchase a people. His delivering Him over for us, for us all, is all about His grace entering in to save the world. But if you define the world as every single human being on the planet, well, that doesn't work either. That creates a new problem because God really does, really will on Judgment Day sin people to hell. So God saves the world by creating a new people. That's how He does it. The new creation comes into being because God has entered in, paid for the sins of His people, and made a whole new creation out of them. So the new creation starts with Jesus' resurrection and then connecting all who will trust in Him to that resurrected Savior. And that becomes the new creation. And that's how God saves the world, not by saving every human being on the face of the planet. Because again, God's justice is important. It's not something that we can say, well, love and justice are at odds. Not in God, maybe in us, maybe in human beings, but in God, they are together harmoniously. And that may be a challenge for us to tease out in our own minds, But in God, there's no contradiction between God's justice and His love. He solved that through the cross by showing His love, His great love for His people in the death of His own Son and solving the problem of God's wrath against sinners in that way. And my intent is not to get lost in all of the discussion about all of these other texts. They are important, and I don't want to be dismissive of those things. But the focus here in Romans 8 is on the distinction between us and those who are not us. There is an us that matters, and it's believers. He's talking about those whom God has chosen is the specific language that Paul uses in this passage. So we have to grapple with that. We can't just say, well, we can throw out the language of election because in other places he uses different words like believes or something like that. We have to be careful that we don't just ignore the details to try to flatten out all of the tensions that are really there in the Scriptures. We want to hold them together confidently and not erase one or drop one for the sake of the other. They have to be held together. 
And sometimes that strains our brains in, in all of this. Because the reality of what we see here, in Romans, back in Romans 8 again, the language of condemnation and judgment is on the table here. And it has been all the way through the book of Romans. Because if you go back to Romans 1, and you skip over to Romans 3, and you just think there for just a minute, God's wrath is against all humanity. All are under his wrath and judgment by nature. Ephesians 2, 3 as well talks about this. And so what we've been reading since Romans 4, and well, really the middle of Romans 3, it's verse 21, all the way through where we are now, is talking about how did he fix that problem? How is it that if all humanity is under the judgment of God, under his wrath, how can anyone be saved? And here, he's finally brought us to the place where not a, he's been focusing on Jesus' death. Romans 3, 21 to 26 is focusing on the event of Jesus' death. That solves the problem of sin. That's what is the remedy, the action that definitively solves the problem. And so the focus has been there. And then you go into Romans 4, and he focuses on how we respond to that great event with faith and we get this righteous verdict, what we call justification. Romans 5 then backs up, well, the first 11 verses give some results that come for people who have been justified by faith. Reconciliation, reconciliation with God. We were enemies, and now we're not. How did that happen? We trusted in Jesus, and we became friends of God. We were on His side at that point because we'd been declared righteous. But then verses 12 through the end of Romans 5 backs the, paper, the story up. So he's been focusing in on Jesus' death, but then he backs up the argument and says, let's go back to the original cause of all of this. And he goes back to Genesis chapter 3 and explains how the fall of Adam, the rebellion of Adam, is what got us in the mess in the first place. The reason that Romans 1.18 is true, that God is pouring out his wrath, communicating his wrath, against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, of people, of humanity, is because of what Adam did in Genesis 3. And so he takes us back there in verses 12 to the end of Romans 5 to remind us that this is not something that's just a problem that's created every time a person is born and grows up. This is something that is the natural state of humanity since Genesis chapter 3. And so he's wanting us to feel the weight of the problem, to see how Jesus' death radically solves that. The contrast between Adam and Christ in verses 12 through 21 of Romans 5 is all about how what Jesus has done on the cross pours out much more grace and gives a much grander benefit than the problem that Adam produced in the world of humanity. And then he comes into Romans 6 and he talks about how those who have responded by faith have been set free from their bondage. And that introduces this new idea that connected to what Adam did in Genesis 3, we all come into this world enslaved. We are slaves. Well, how do we get free? And the focus there is again on Jesus' death, has broken the chains that enslaved us, the, the chains of our sin and our guilt. And he has solved that problem. But again, only for some, only for those who believe. And then in chapter 7, he takes a detour and he says, why didn't the law fix the problem? Why didn't the Mosaic law fix the problem? God gives us all these commands and tells us this is how to live righteously. Why didn't that solve the problem? Because humanity is still in the flesh. Humanity in Adam can't do the law. And so does, should imply can? No, not biblically. There are explicit statements in scripture that break that logic. The should implies can logical argument is a logical thing in our mind, but biblically there's too many verses that go directly against it that say you cannot please God. Romans 8, 7. All humanity is stuck in a position that they cannot please God. And so how do you get to the place where you can please God? God's got to do something. He's got to set you free. He's got to give you life. And that happens in the moment of faith. 
And all of that is built into these arguments that are in the background of where Paul is coming to this grand conclusion at the end of Romans 8. And all that he's looked at, he's wanting to highlight, again, Jesus' death and resurrection is the key piece of all of this. And the way that we experience the benefits and live out that faith and that freedom is by the power of the Holy Spirit. And without that power of the Holy Spirit, you cannot, you're still stuck, trapped, enslaved, in bondage to Your sin, the natural state given to us through Adam. And so when Romans 8 says that the the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law, if he had stopped right there, we could still have a conversation about, given the imperatives of the law, doesn't that imply that we should have the ability to respond with obedience to the law? But then he adds, indeed, it cannot Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. There's a fundamental inability that's there. And that has to be changed. There has to be an ability given, a new ability. And the whole point of Romans 8, the main point, I suppose, is that it's the Holy Spirit who provides that ability, that can-ness. Yes, Ed. Sure, I guess so. I do not know. I think probably, but the text I don't think gives us enough data to know whether they expressed any faith. I think there's a hint that they did, but it's nothing more than that. Well, it lays the groundwork. It wasn't just for them. I mean, it's for us. All of the promises of God that are laid out there, starting with Genesis 3, 15 are for us, for his people, ultimately, and that's who receives the fulfillment of these grand promises. So, yes, Yvonne. Oh, gosh, you asked two questions. Um, <laughs> the second one, can we change the mind of God? I don't think so. I don't think we can change the mind of God, but that... I, So how do we pray for our children? We ask God to open their hearts. We ask God to enable them to believe. We ask God to give them salvation. We ask God for grace for them. We we pray what we see pictured for us in Ezekiel 36. We ask God to give them a new heart. And we pray and ask him to do that. And why do we do that? Because he's the only one who can do it. That's why we pray for our unbelieving neighbors, friends, family members, children, because only God can do this. We don't go around just, I hope, saying, you need to believe in Jesus. But we ask God to help them believe because he's got to do it. That's why we pray, because we can't do it. And they can't do it. God has to do it. That's what salvation is. It's all of God. And So we pray. I mean, that's the whole point of prayer, is to ask Him to be involved, to ask Him to do what He's promised to do. If anybody's going to receive life in this world, He's got to give it. And so we ask Him to give it until He does. (laughs) And then we ask Him to grow it and cultivate it and watch as He does and participate in the process as He's called us to and given us responsibility to. Hmm. Jill? That's right. Uh, I mean, that's the thing. Faith biblically is in the heart. It's not in the head. It is in the heart. You must believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, Romans 10, 9. And so, yeah, you can get all the head knowledge you want. There are lots of unbelievers who, if they do not repent and respond to the gospel with faith, they will go to hell on judgment day, who know the Bible better than I do, who can quote more scripture than I can or than any believer can. They know the biblical languages. They, there are people like that in this world. They filled their head 
with knowledge, and they can tell you all of the theological answers and how things fit together, but they don't know Jesus. They don't have a personal relationship with Him. And that is the difference. The Spirit of God has not given them life. The Spirit of God has not enabled them to believe from their heart. They can say all this stuff, and then they can tell you, yeah, this is the way the theology works out, and I don't believe it. I believe it's all a myth. And there are real people like that. And they need grace, and they need for us to be praying and asking God to graciously give them life. John 6 gives a verse at the end, John 6, 64, 6, 67, somewhere thereof, that it's the Spirit who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. It doesn't contribute to the process. It's just like the birth of a baby. The baby doesn't do anything. It gets born. <laughs> the, the baby doesn't do anything to contribute to its birth. It is born. It's a passive thing. Same thing with the new birth, to be born again. I think that's why Jesus uses the imagery, is to emphasize that this is a, an absolute miracle of God when someone receives life. And it's the Spirit of God who produces that. And I don't work up to it, and I don't contribute to it. I respond to it with faith. I, I think I, I've likened, in this room probably, I've likened faith to the first breath that a baby takes in this world. It is the baby comes out and we hope we hear crying because that's indicative that they're breathing, that they're alive. And I think that's exactly why Jesus uses that metaphor because that's the way spiritual birth happens. The wind blows where it wills, but you don't know where it comes from or where it's going. So, yes, the Spirit is the one who is the definitive agent in all of that, and we respond, and that is where our will is engaged. Okay, This is not to ignore the will. Our response is an act of the will. But our will, five seconds before, was hardened and against God. Well, what happened? God changed our will. He can do that. Do you think the will, the human will, is off limits to God? That he can't change your nature? I hope you don't believe that because that's a very fundamental definition of salvation at one level. He changes our nature. What we once were, we are no longer. He can change us so fundamentally that then we become a new person. Isn't that what Paul says? Anyone who is in Christ is a new creature. You've been created into something you were not before. You're new. Don? That's exactly what I was going to refer to as that. We've been remade. We've been changed. But we're also, I believe, in that new creation, our, uh, our object is to submit to the authority and the love of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Of course, yeah, absolutely. So, the philosophical questions that plague us, because I think that's really where the rub is for us experientially, is when does my, what is my will doing in all of this? What am I doing in all of this? And I, I, I want to stick with the way the Bible describes our will, because it does not describe a will that is free. It, it doesn't describe that anywhere. The reality is our, the will. So think about what is, the, what is the will. Simply speaking, it is our ability and act of making choices. Okay? Everywhere in the Bible, when human beings make choices, they are always, always, always influenced by something. You know this practically if you think about it. And I would go so far as to say you have never, as an individual, made an individual choice that wasn't influenced by something else, whether inside of you or outside of you. From the decision to whether you're going to buy shoes with laces or not, from the silly decisions about where you're going to go eat for lunch. I bet your stomach has something to do with that. 
and the physical feeling of hunger and the preferences that you have already developed for certain kinds of foods. Those are all influences. The will, human will never acts nakedly. Human will never acts independently. It is always influenced by something. And so the problem with human nature, as we get it from Adam, is that it's influenced by all the wrong things. That the influence is the dominant controlling influences, enslaving influences, is what the Bible gives us, Romans 6 in particular. Sin, Satan, and death are the dominant influences on the choices that we make. So that every choice that a human being makes who is not a believer in Jesus is sin. Paul speaks to this in Romans chapter 14 when he says, whatever does not come from faith is sin. And if you've got no faith in Jesus, everything you do is laced with sin. When you become a Christian and you become a new creature, you get a new influence, a new power that influences your will to do pleasing things to God, to express faith and to live out of that faith. That's what we're talking about here. And different images are used in Scripture to define that, but they're all really, really stark images. We're talking about Ezekiel 36. Your heart was a rock. It did not beat and pump blood through your body. And God said, I will be a heart surgeon for you. I will open up your chest cavity and I will take that stupid rock out and I will put something new in. And then it will start beating and pumping blood. What is that an image for? It's an image for beginning to respond appropriately to God, to please Him by faith and obedience. That's what we're talking about here. Ed, final question, and then we got to cut it off. Are you saying that, not to make too big a jump, but are you saying that the moment that the Spirit comes in, that we, at that moment, do we actually have free will, or are we simply subject to God's desire to save us at that moment? I mean, I'm looking at John 6, 29, and I'm wondering, is there a separation Well, either way you go, yeah, and either way you go, well, that it it seems like there's a it's an it's oversimplistic. It's not just this either-or kind of system. And if you go down just a little bit further, in John 6, you will find him say explicitly, you cannot believe. So he just said, as you pointed out, the only work that God expects is, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he, sent, whom he has sent. And then just in the, a paragraph or two later, he says the very things that you cannot believe. So the same people he's talking to, he says, this is what God expects, and yet you cannot do that. And I'm scanning to look for the verse here, but maybe I have to... Well, that'll work, but he says it three other times in the section. I'm just, my, all of the words are bleeding together right now. So, but yes, several times in the passage, Jesus says explicitly, cannot and it's connected to believe. So, well, I'm so glad. <laughs> yeah, John. Just a little later in that verse, and this is just a definitive intent to go back to what we're talking about, about the Holy Spirit enables me to make that choice. I think in time and space at that moment, it was my free will. But I had nothing to do with it, because I never would have chosen that. I was lost. I was enslaved. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws me. And and that definitive answer right there is that I struggle with these things. I really struggled with them when I came to Christ. I struggle with them now with the deaths in my family, needed family. I struggle with these things. Yeah. But I trust God is fair and righteous and he will do what is right. I trust him in that. Yeah. And so 
once heard Piper say when I was struggling through this, when I listened to the Hewlett case, it just doesn't seem right. That's not fair. You know, well, that's not fair that God chose me, but then not choose my brother. That's sure. not fair. Yeah. And he said, you know what? You want fair? We all go to hell. That's fair. <laughs> we all that's hell. right. <laughs> yes. I'll get what I deserve from my actions, my choices. Yeah. It comes back to those choices. But I'm a slave to those choices before in a moment in time the Holy Spirit right. comes into me and I think I'm making that choice and choosing God. Hmm. But he enabled me and gave me the faith and the power to do that or I never would have come to him. Never. So we've opened the can of worms and it continues to wriggle. I fully expect that. I'm not in any way pretending. I said this last time. These are things that the church has debated throughout church history and will continue to discuss and disagree about at times until Jesus returns and sets us all straight. Is this a salvation issue? There's, that's a good question. Of course not. Again, throughout church history, believers... Christians, faithful people holding up their Bible and trying to understand what it says are going to come to different conclusions on this question and how to view this. And you're not going to be condemned to hell if you get it wrong. But there is a right answer. And we all are seeking that together. And I appreciate the dialogue. I appreciate the questions. I don't, I'm not going to stand up here and say, I can settle all this for you. If you'll just listen to what I say, you won't. You won't have a problem. You won't be confused ever again. Come on, man. Don't think I believe that. I don't. Not at all. I, I experience confusion. I, I experience difficulty because this book is hard. It's big. Real big. Real complicated. Because God is real big and real complicated. What? It's alive. I thought you said it's a lie. I was like, what? <laughs> Thanks, Don, for the moment of levity. We need it when we get into tension like this. Happy birthday, Jill. What? Happy birthday, Jill. Oh, happy birthday, Jill. We won't sing to you on the internet, so it's okay. So let me, let me dismiss us. Let me just say one more word. We're over time by about five minutes, and the kids are restless, I'm sure, and the workers are struggling, <laughs> probably, because um, mine's in there. Um, again... We should be able to ask these questions, and I don't, I don't want you to think that I'm being dismissive of your questions. They are important. The questions that you're asking and that you're wrestling with are important, and don't stop asking them, even if you don't like my answers. I'm just giving you my answers. I'm trying to point you to what I see in the Scriptures, and you can do that with me. I need to see things more clearly, and you can help me with that. Your questions are often clarifying for me, and so please talk, if you're, especially if, if this bothers you. If you, if you stay up at night <laughs> struggling with these things, let's have a conversation. I may make you stay up later, longer, more days. But I'm confident that if we're both sticking our noses in this book, that the outcome will be good and growth for all of us. And that's what I long for for each one of us. I, don't, I do care if you see things the way that I do. Okay. I'm not going to sit up here and say that I don't care. I mean, I'm trying to persuade you at one level. But I don't love you any less if we don't see these things eye to eye. Or if you still have questions that my answers are not satisfying to you. And I hope that you don't love me less because I, I have these convictions and beliefs. We should be able to love each other well and hold these things differently. And so let's try to do that. Next time... We'll press on in Romans 8. We'll see if we can avoid some of these kinds of questions in the midst of our discussion. But again, I welcome them. So please don't hear me dismissing them. Let me dismiss you by praying. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the, the reality that whatever we think about the mechanics, it is beautiful and loving and gracious of you that you have indeed chosen us. We could, should be able to all agree on that. And so we thank you that though there was nothing commending us to you, you chose to bring salvation into this world. We could even put it more generally that way. You have chosen to send your son, to hand him over, to pay for sins. You didn't have to do that. No one obligated you to do that. You freely chose to do that. If anybody has freedom in the universe, it's you. And so we thank you, Father, that you've exercised your freedom and your power on our behalf to do us good, even though we deserve your wrath. 
and your judgment. So thank you for making a way for us to be set free from condemnation, set free from the guilt of our sin, and to be free to live in a loving, joyful relationship with you forever. We look forward to the culmination of these things. We look forward to greater clarity on these things, maybe in this life, maybe not. But we thank you that we can count on you to do what is good and what is right all the time. And so we commit ourselves to you. We rest in you for the things that we don't understand. In Jesus' name, amen.